This video covers probability distributions for discrete and continuous random variables. There are several learning objectives for this video. For example, you will be able to distinguish between discrete and continuous random variables and explain the difference between a density and a distribution function. Let's start with some basic terminology and a review of probability. A random variable maps outcomes from a random process to a number. It is typically notated with an uppercase letter, and the specific observed value of a random variable is denoted with a lowercase letter. As an example, let the random variable x be the height of a randomly selected person, or let the random variable x be the number of heads when three coins are flipped, or let the random variable x be the number of test questions answered correctly. There are two different types of random variables. Discrete random variables have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the positive integers. This type of data is often referred to as nominal or ordinal. An example is the finishing order of runners in a race. Continuous random variables take on any number in an interval, and there are, are an infinite number of possibilities. For example, if we were interested in a person's height, there are, are an infinite number of values between 60.1 inches and 60.2 inches. A person's height could be 60.19 inches, or it could be 60.198121 inches. It could be 60.198123514121 inches. There is no end to the number of possible values in an interval. Continuous data are often referred to as interval or ratio data. Before discussing probability distributions, we will review basic probability. In a frequentist paradigm, Probability is defined as the number of events of interest divided by the total number of events. It is a relative frequency. Additional probability axioms state that the probability must be, be between 0 and 1 inclusive, and the total probability of all events in the outcome space must be 1. Consider two examples. Let the random variable x be the side of the coin facing up after a fair toss. What is the probability that x will be heads? The total number of events is 2, 1 heads and 1 tails, and the number of events of interest is 1. Therefore, the probability of tossing a head is 1 half. Now let the random variable x be the number facing up when a six-sided die is rolled. What is the probability of observing four dots? There is only one way to roll a 4 on a six-sided die. Therefore, the probability is 1 six. These two examples give the probability of a single event. However, we often would like to know about all possible events and the probability of observing each one. For this information, we need a probability distribution. A probability distribution describes all possible values of a random variable and the probability of observing each one. For example, suppose you have eight balls in a jar, two red, three blue, one green, and two yellow. If you reach in and grab one, what is the probability of each color? As you can see in the table, two of the balls are red, therefore the probability of a red ball is 2 eighths. There is one green ball in the jar, therefore the probability of a green ball is 1 eighth. All of the other values and their corresponding probabilities are shown in the table. In this simple example, we listed all possible outcomes, but many times the problem is too large to enumerate every outcome. In these cases, we rely on a mathematical function to obtain the probability of each event. For a discrete random variable, this function is referred to as a probability mass function, or PMF. It provides the probability of observing each possible value. Furthermore, the probability of any particular value in the outcome space must be greater than zero, and the sum of the probabilities for every outcome must be one. As a result, all probabilities from a PMF are between zero and one inclusive, just as they were when we reviewed basic probability. The binomial distribution is an example of a discrete probability mass function. It gives the probability of the number of successes in n independent trials of an experiment with only two possible outcomes. The function is shown here along with the table of values and probabilities. The figure illustrates the information in the table. For example, Suppose a professor uses a very difficult test question on an exam such that only 30% of examinees have ever answered it correctly. 
In a sample of five students, what is the probability that no one will answer it correctly? What is the probability that three students will answer it correctly? According to the table, the probability of no students answering this item correctly is 0 0.16807, and the probability of three students answering it correctly is 0 0.1323. A continuous random variable has a density function that is defined in a similar way as a probability mass function, but there is an important distinction. The continuous nature requires the use of an integral instead of a summation. If you are unfamiliar with calculus, an integral is like a continuous sum. It gives the area under a curve between two distinct points. A continuous probability density function, or PDF, does not give the probability of an exact value, Rather, it gives the probability that a value lies in an interval that ranges from A to B. As such, it requires that each density value, f of x, be greater than zero, and that the total area under the curve be equal to one. The normal probability density function is the function that people refer to when they say the normal distribution. The function is shown here along with the picture of it. We can use the PDF to compute the density of a value but not the probability itself. The cumulative distribution function is defined as capital F of x, which is equal to the probability that the random variable x is less than or equal to some value x. For a discrete random variable, the CDF is just the sum of the probability mass function for all values less than or equal to x. For a continuous random variable, the CDF is the area under the curve from negative infinity to the value of interest. We can use the CDF of a continuous variable to compute the probability that x is in any interval. We simply compute the CDF at the upper bound of the interval and subtract from it the CDF at the lower bound of the interval. This calculation should make evident the reason why we cannot compute the probability that a continuous random variable is exactly a particular value. As you can see, f of x minus f of x equals zero. Therefore, for a continuous random variable, we compute the probability that x is in an interval, not the probability that x is exactly some value. Let's return to the binomial distribution for an example of a discrete CDF. The binomial CDF is shown on the slide and it looks similar to the binomial PMF. The only difference is that a summation sign has been included in the equation. Values for this binomial CDF have been added to the third column of the table. Looking at the values in the table, it is easy to see that the probability of three or fewer students answering the item correctly is 0 0.96922. Conversely, the probability of four or five students answering it correctly is one minus 0 0.96922, or 0 0.03078. The figure on this slide illustrates the binomial CDF. Notice how the bars in the figure increase in size as the number of successes increases. This pattern is also evident in the third column of the table. All CDFs will increase as the values increase. The next slide shows an example of a continuous CDF. This slide shows the normal CDF and an illustration of it. Only in rare cases would you compute this function or any CDF by hand. Most of the time, you will use a computer to do it, or you would get the values from a table that you can find in most any statistics textbook. This figure shows the PDF and CDF on the same chart. The PDF is the black line, and the CDF is the blue dashed line. To see the relationship between the PDF and the CDF more clearly, a short animation will show the area under the PDF that corresponds to the value of the CDF. You will see that the shaded area under the PDF will increase as the value of the CDF increases. The last type of function that we will discuss is the inverse distribution function, or IDF. As you might guess from the name, this function is the inverse of the CDF. It gives cumulative probabilities on the x-axis and values of x on the y-axis.
The CDF is shown in the figure on the left, and the IDF is shown in the figure on the right. If you look closely, you can see that the only difference between the two figures is that the axes have been transposed. Arrows have been added to the figures to demonstrate that the CDF and IDF are inverse operations. According to the CDF, an x value of 1 has a cumulative probability of 0.841, and according to the IDF, the probability of 0.841 corresponds to an x value of 1. The CDF and IDF are frequently encountered in statistics. In descriptive statistics, we use the CDF to compute percentile ranks, which is the percentage of scores less than or equal to the value of interest. We also use the IDF to compute percentile points, which is the value below which a certain percentage of scores fall below. Although we have not yet discussed inferential statistics, know that we use the CDF to compute p-values and an IDF to compute critical values. We will return to p-values and critical values later in the semester. For normally distributed data, the percentile rank is obtained by converting all values to z-scores. That is, we standardize the values to have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. Then we can use the normal CDF to obtain the probability of observing a value less than or equal to a z-score. We don't just use any normal distribution for this computation. We use the standard normal distribution because it too has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. An example will make these steps more clear. Suppose that we know our population distribution has a mean of 125 and a standard deviation of 13. What is the percentile rank for a score of 143? We first compute 143 to a z-score to find 1.385. Then using the standard normal CDF, we see that the probability that z is less than or equal to 1.385 is 0.917. Consequently, we know that about 92% of examinees scored less than 143. A percentile point is obtained in a similar way, but we start with a known probability, and we try to find the corresponding z-score from the distribution function. It is the inverse of finding a percentile rank. The steps involve finding the z-score and then transforming to the original metric. To see how these computations are done, consider an example. Suppose again that our distribution has a mean of 125 and a standard deviation of 13. What score corresponds to the 40th percentile? From the inverse density function, we find that the z-score that corresponds to the 40th percentile is negative 0.253. Using a linear transformation, we transform this z-score to get a value of 121.711. Thus, the 40th percentile is a score of 121.711. Up to this point, we have assumed that our data came from a particular distribution, such as the normal distribution. If our assumption is wrong, then our percentile ranks and percentile points will be inaccurate. Instead of making assumptions, we can estimate probability densities and distribution functions directly from the data. Likewise, we can compute empirical percentile ranks and percentile points without making any assumptions. When we estimate a density or distribution function, we often create a picture of it or a table of values. For example, a probability mass function for a discrete random variable is illustrated with a bar chart or presented in tabular form as frequencies, relative frequencies, or percentages. For continuous data, a histogram is the most common way to illustrate a probability density function. If it has been standardized, then the area represented by all of the bars of the histogram will equal 1. A histogram is computed from group data by dividing the range into intervals and counting the number of observations in each interval. These counts can then be converted to percentages or densities. Here you see an example data set that has been grouped into three intervals. The count and cumulative count for each interval are listed in the table and illustrated in the histogram. You are probably quite familiar with the histograms, but you probably are not familiar with the figure we use to illustrate a continuous CDF. 
The empirical cumulative distribution function, or ECDF, is what we use to estimate the CDF of a continuous variable. It is a step function that increases by k over n at each unique value. Computing it is simple for small data sets, but the calculations can be tedious for large data sets and hand calculations. First, rank the values from smallest to largest, then count the number of tied values and compute the relative frequency of each unique value. Then sum the relative frequencies in a cumulative fashion. For example, using the data from the histogram example, there were two eights and one nine. Therefore, the probability of an eight is two tenths and the probability of a nine is one tenth. Furthermore, the cumulative probability of an eight, the lowest value, is two tenths, and the cumulative probability of a nine is three tenths. The remaining cumulative probabilities are listed in the table and illustrated in the figure. Notice how the figure jumps at each unique value. Using the ECDF to estimate a CDF works best when you have large amounts of data because the function becomes more smooth as the sample size increases. Here is an example with a larger data set. It shows the histogram and ECDF together. This figure should remind you of the one for the normal PDF and CDF. The only difference is that we are estimating the distribution and density directly from the data without making any assumptions about the nature of the data. As shown for the normal distribution, we can use the ECDF to compute percentile ranks. The percentile rank computation is shown graphically with the arrows in the figure. The ECDF is the way the computer software would compute empirical percentile ranks. But for large data sets, you would not use this method for hand calculations. It is best to compute percentile ranks from a grouped frequency distribution when doing the calculations by hand. Empirical percentile points may also be calculated from the ECDF. This computation starts with a probability and finds the corresponding value of x. For large data sets and hand calculations, it is best to use a grouped frequency distribution to compute percentile points instead of using the ECDF itself.